Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vandermolen, and I'm the ministry director and online venue pastor here at the Foundry. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat bar. We'd love to know who's joining us um, for our worship service. Also, if this is your first time worshiping with us, I encourage you to text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and then press the number one key. That will, that will be a way for you to get updates and information about what's going on here at the Foundry Church. A couple announcements to share with you. First, our devotional books. Um, these devotionals were put together by our amazing team of writers and are available to you for free. What's unique about these books is that as you read each devotional throughout the week, it, it will prepare you for what the pastor is going to talk about on the next Sunday as he gives the next Sunday message. So um, it's just a way to have a better context and understanding of what the pastor will be talking about. If you have not picked one up, you can do so. Go to the West or East Doors at any time um, in the airlock. You can find a hard copy there. You can go to our website online or not online, go to foundrychurch.net, scroll down, you'll find electronic copy there. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and you'd like us to ship one to you, send me an email online at foundrychurch.net. I'll make sure one gets shipped out to you. I want to say thank you for your generosity with your offerings and God's ties. If you'd like to give to the Foundry Church, you can do so by going to our homepage, foundrychurch.net, clicking on the Give tab and following the instructions there or you can mail us your offering. The address of our church is up on the screen right now. So at 11.15 today, um, after the online worship service, we're going to be having an online shakeout lesson. Um, these lessons are put together by Hannah McAndrews, who is a college student, and uh, she had a heart for um, uh, uh, putting these messages together for the kids. So 11.15 today, kids, we encourage you to tune in um, and just learn more about God and grow in your relationship with him. In an update from the mission team here at the Foundry Church, um, the Dominican Republic mission team made it back safely to Michigan last late last week, Saturday night. Um, the Lord um, was hand was upon their trip and uh, many prayers were answered. Um, they were able to start building the second story of a school there in the Dominican Republic. We're also able just to continue to grow in relationship with the kids and the community there. So um, we're so thankful for the way that God answered prayers and that they made it back here safely. Um, so praise the Lord for that and um, yeah, we're thankful for the ways he worked through that. For a care announcement this morning, um, it's with heavy hearts that we want to make you aware that Terry Stewart, um, who attended the Foundry Church and was involved um, with worship here in the, at Foundry, Maine and at Foundry West when they were meeting, um, passed away unexpectedly earlier this month. Um, he leaves behind his wife, Amy, and his son, Jonah. So we just encourage you to be in prayer for the family. And um, if you'd like to send them a letter, or, or just send love their way, you can um, email me at online, online at foundrychurch.net and I can get you some of their information. So just please be lifting them up during prayer during this, this hard time. All right, let's, let's open a word of prayer before we jump into the worship service this morning. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and I thank you that we get to worship you. Um, God, I thank you that you are the king of the world and that you sit on the throne um, God, and I, I praise you for the many prayers that were answered in regards to the D Dominican Republic uh, mission trip, Lord. I thank you that they were able to make progress on the school there and um, that they were able to grow in relationship and further grow in relationship and strengthen those relationships with the community and, and the kids down in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I just pray that you continue to bless the ongoing relationship and that the people there would be, would be open to hearing your gospel, Lord. Um, Lord, and that um, they would just, they would experience your love and know you for who you truly are. And Lord, I too just want to lift up the Stewart family this morning. Um, God is, a, a death is, is so hard and when it happens unexpectedly, it's, it's, it seems like it's even harder. So I just pray that you come around the uh, Stewart family. Would you give them comfort? Would you give them peace? And would they be able to mourn and just grieve his loss, oh, um, God? And just please be with them during this time. And Lord, as we worship this morning, I pray that you be with Pastor Eric as he gives the message. May the words that he speaks be words that come from you. And um, Lord, would you wash over him with your peace. And um, 
Lord, may you open our hearts too for what it is you want us to hear this morning. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to the Foundry. My name is Kendra, and the worship team and I are so happy to worship our great God with you today. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We serve a wonderful, powerful, great God. In worship, we have the opportunity to declare who He is and stand before Him, recognizing that all we have comes from Him. He is our Creator, our Savior, and the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's praise the King of Kings together.
Dear Lord, just like we sang, you are the very breath in our lungs. You are the King of Kings. Teach us today through your words. Speak through Eric, and may our hearts soft and pliable to your Holy Spirit. Help us not to just hear, but to listen and obey what you would teach us. Help us to learn to walk with you just as Jesus showed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome, Foundry Church. Uh, we're going to dive right in today, and we're going to talk, um, you know, because one of the things we know is it's hard to explain um, what it is to fear the Lord and, and how to walk in the fear of the Lord. I would say try to understand it this way when you think of how, how do we try to walk in the fear of the Lord. Think of it this way. It's hard to swagger when you walk in the fear of the Lord. Fear doesn't swagger. And if you're like, what does swagger look like? Check out this amazing clip. Yeah. Well, you can't tell by the way I feel. I'm a woman's man. No time to talk. Whether your mother, whether your brother, you're staying alive. Staying alive. Ha, 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 ha. No, that's not good. <laughs> All right, stay alive. When you swagger or when you strut, you, you're confident in you. When, when you have those things, you're confident in you. But Jesus feared the Lord. And so we know that we can learn how to walk with the Lord based on how Jesus did it. We want to watch and look, how did Jesus fear the Lord in real situations? I think the best way to look at this is to take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, and let that be kind of the background and the template for what it looks like to walk with the Lord and walk in the fear of the Lord. It says this in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Um, and you'll notice the words on the screen. Um, this is a scripture I memorized a long time ago, so sometimes I, I transpose a word here and there. I'm dyslexic. Go easy on me. So if the words are a little different at times, I apologize. Uh, but I did want to read those. I want you to hear these kind of as a story. Now Jesus was led, after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he did not eat anything for 40 days. At the end of those 40 days, he was hungry. And the tempter, Satan, came to him, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus replied, It is written, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, jump. For it is written that he will give his angels, he will command his angels concerning you, that they will bear you up, and you won't even, you, you won't even strike your foot against a stone when you land. And Jesus replied, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then Satan walked him to the top of a hill. And in an instant he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their wealth and splendor. And he said, all these things I will give to you if only you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus replied to him, it is written, 
Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Away from me, he said. And Satan departed from him, and the angels came and attended to Jesus. When we look at that and see that, that Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord, what we want to do is take a look in this second section of our book, of our study in Proverbs, and realize that we are going to learn about our personal relationship or walk with our Heavenly Father. We're going to learn how to relate to the Lord, how to walk in the fear of God. And I'm going to take three verses today out of that wisdom book that you have that is written out of the book of Proverbs. We're going to take three Proverbs today, and we're going to look at those, and we're going to understand a little bit more of how Jesus modeled walking in the fear of the Lord. How did he model these truths? What example did he give us? Please don't miss that Jesus dismissed the tempter, Satan, by quoting back to him the word of God. He used the word of God to deflect the temptations which were very real from him. And the verses that came that Jesus used, we're gonna look at it. So what I would like to do today is recognize that for Jesus Christ in his moment of temptation, the thing he had that weighed the most in that temptation was the simple fact that he knew the scriptures. He knew the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. He knew them. He had cherished them and learned them. And when the temptation came, he spoke those back. They were part of his story. They were part of his genealogical story. He was part of the people of Israel. He knew God's plan based on what he had learned from Scripture as a little boy. And these words were important to him and deeply personal. Church, being in the Word of God, knowing the stories, knowing the verses, really, really matters. It's an important thing that we sift our life through the Word of God, that the Word of God is what we sift our life through. And we know that this is of utmost importance. Why? Because Jesus did it. Jesus sifted that temptation through the Word of God. He sifted it through the Word of God. So today, the teaching rhythm is going to be kind of interesting. What we're going to do is we are going to look at one of the Proverbs about fearing the Lord. Then we're going to kind of put a lens over it and look at it through the story in Matthew. And then we're going to take, and we're going to take kind of a a trifocal. Yeah, not a bifocal. We went trifocal today. Um, A trifocal, another filter, and we're going to look at it from the Deuteronomic, the the book of Deuteronomy, from that scripture that Jesus quoted. So Proverb, uh, the gospel story with Jesus, and then the story that Jesus was quoting scripture from. And we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to jump in, starting with this proverb, Proverb number one for today. Proverbs 9, verse 10, it says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So how was Jesus tempted first? How was Jesus first tempted? Jesus was really hungry, and Satan came and played at a very real moment of weakness. Like if you hadn't eaten for, if I hadn't eaten for two days, I'd pretty much eat anything off a flip-flop maybe even in a bathroom, I would be hungry, right? But it had been 40 days. Jesus was famished. He was hungry. He was human. He he felt that hunger and that need. And we all have weaknesses. Remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin when we give in to the temptation. And what did Jesus do that walked in the fear of the Lord? He did not let his body and his real desire for food, food rule his actions. He didn't let his body that had real weakness and need rule his actions. He replied to Satan, man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, if Jesus said it is written, where is it written? Deuteronomy chapter eight. Okay, so you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Okay, right there. Numbers, I I totally messed up. Let's do that again. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So the fifth book. Man, why did I have to mess that up? But we're gonna keep it in there because that's just me being me. Um, But you have the fifth book in the Pentateuch, the first five books. Um, And what Jesus did is he pulled from the story in Deuteronomy chapter eight. And this is a fascinating story. 
but he used the word of God to deflect the enemy's very real temptation. But um, there is so much more to that verse than what Jesus just quoted. So let's learn about what happened in the wilderness. And maybe you're visiting here or watching and you're like, where are we going? Here's the cool thing. Jesus is quoting a scripture that is deep in his family history, thousands of years old. It was when Moses had led the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt into the wilderness and uh, God had parted the Red Sea, they had crossed it and they were out in the middle of the wilderness and they were going through there and here is what we see. Moses, who is leading, again, thousands of years before Jesus, but he's a blood relative to them. Moses is leading the people of God, and he says this to them. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Super important. How many days had Jesus been alone in the wilderness fasting? 40 days. So that numerology is kind of in there. It's saying it's significant. There's something related in that. And it says this. He set you there to humble you and to test you and to find out what was in your heart. Oh, we are super seeing that that's, that's God's sifting Christ, he is sifting his life in the story of scripture and he wanted to know what was in their heart in Deuteronomy, it says that. And it says whether or not you would keep his commandments. God was sifting the people of God in the desert to see whether or not they would follow his commandments and obey him and love him. And we can say that in some way this season for Jesus was a purification, a clarity of his vision, from, of God's vision for him to be the redeemer of all people. So we look at that and we're like, wow, this is really kind of, God's really drawing this out. And it says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known. Get this. And he did it to teach you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God was giving them the law while they were in the desert. And we see this beautiful moment where God's saying, I'm giving you my word. And who is Jesus but the word made flesh? And we can look at this and what we're seeing is Jesus is really saying one thing very clearly in his response. God will provide. This desert has nothing to offer me and... um to eat, but I believe God will provide. And even though I am starving and hunger, hungry, Jesus knew this truth from Scripture to be absolutely true, that God would provide. God would provide for him. And he didn't need to disobey God and take action and provide for himself. God knew, or Jesus knew, that he could withstand the physical temptation because he trusted just flat out that God would be enough and God would provide. So let me just ask you this. How does that apply to your life? I've got to think this applies in very real ways. Is Do you believe that God will be enough? And if you have that lingering doubt, you might go through a sifting process where God brings you to a place where you're dependent on him. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's because when we look at how Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord and trusted him, his, his appetite didn't define his actions. Proverb number two that we're gonna look at. Proverbs 14, verses six, it says this. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed, and yet he feels secure. So how was Jesus tempted the second time? Remember, the second time, Satan stood him on top of the temple and said, jump. If you are the son of God, jump, because he has commanded his angels concerning you. Satan misquotes scripture here, by the way. His angels concerning you that you will not, they will bear you up. They will catch you. You won't even stub your toe when you land, and everybody will know that you are God. You'll be, you'll be glorified, right? Satan's tempting him to do something rash and not fear the consequences, I mean, all of us can just instantly, most of us can think back to our teenage years and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I gave in to that one once or 10 times. Because we look at it and we realize that sometimes when we do something rash or hot-headed or not thinking of the consequences, it has pretty serious consequences. And sin is believing that God doesn't care, that it doesn't matter what I do, to act rashly or hot-headedly. 
And, and Satan used the word of God against Jesus Christ. He tried to manipulate him and said, he has to save you. Just do it. Come on, do it, do it, do it. Kind of a high-pressure sales tactic. Do it. Come on, you're good. But Jesus would not do it. He didn't have to prove to Satan that he was the son of God by doing it. He proved his identity by saying, once again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, where did that scripture come from? Once again, we find ourselves in the fifth, not fourth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter six. It's the story of Massah. And um, here's what happens. The Israelite community had set off. They were following Moses. And um, before they were following Moses in the desert, they were slaves, like horribly in, in bondage, slaves in Egypt. And what had happened? God had freed them out of there. But this is what they said to Moses when things got tough in the desert. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Us and our children and our cattle to die of thirst. Oh, and Moses, I think he said, um, what am I to do with these people? I think Moses got super frustrated. I know he did. Super frustrated. He's like, God, what am I supposed to do with these people? And God said to him, go out and strike the rock and water will flow and they won't die of thirst in this desert. God would provide for them. Jesus was recalling this story that God would provide and that Moses knew that these people were putting God to the test. It goes on to say in verse seven, and Moses went to call the place Massah or Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is God among us or isn't he? When we do something that tests the Lord, when we are hot-headed and feel secure, well, let's just be honest. The people in Israel in Deuteronomy, they acted rashly. They acted hot-headed. They were angry. They were frustrated. And they dared to question God's character. They questioned God's character. Is he here or isn't he here? Kind of throw their arms up like, is he with us or not? Literally, these people had walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. They had seen the hand of God, but they complained. They were emotional and hot-headed and frustrated and hot and tired, and he, and they kind of lit into Moses. And I believe this, that if Jesus had not feared the Lord, he would have jumped, because why, would, like, why wouldn't you? If you were hot-headed, given into, he's been alone for all this time. The idea that he could jump off the top of the temple, be caught by the angels, surrounded by his people, like literally his national, his group of people, that his friends, his family, and seen as this wonderful Messiah would have been very appealing. And a hot-headed person who didn't fear the Lord would, would probably have done it. But Jesus feared the Lord and respected and honored him. By saying, it is written. He knows his identity. He knows what's going on. That it is written that we're not to put the Lord our God to the test. So he wasn't going to test God like Israel had done in the desert. He wasn't going to complain and do something rash and hot-headed. How does this apply to you? How does the fear of the Lord help you respond to temptation about being prideful? About being like someone who says, you know, I'm... I did this on my own. I pulled myself up. Or, or being prideful and, and shouting at God when things don't go well. How dare you let this happen, God? Shaking your fist at him because you don't like what's happening and saying, why have you left me here? Why did you do this? Sometimes it's not for us to know. And we go through brutally hard seasons where our hearts are broken and our lives are wrecked. And we think, oh my goodness, I feel so alone. But I will tell you this, don't ever put the character of God to the test. He says he will never leave you. He will never let you go. We hold that promise, especially in the darkest of times. God is the friend who can sit in silence with us when there are no words that would comfort and sit and just be with us. Be a constant companion and friend and one who comforts us by his Holy Spirit and the promise of life in Christ. When we look at this and understand that this has to apply to us because we as emotional people can react and get hot-headed. So how does the fear of the Lord help you against the temptation to be prideful 
or to complain and to test God. How does that help you? I do know this, that this verse has been a warning in my life as someone who, um, who really enjoys verbal processing and working things out. I know that this one has been important for me. And I've shared uh, a few months ago about one time where I kind of just sounded off and I was talking to Erica and I just kind of vented some rage and I look back on that and I'm so sorry that I did that. This applies to me in how can I allow God to get a hold of my tongue and my emotions so I don't justify my reactions. This is very personal. Let's jump to Proverbs, our third proverb that we're gonna look at here. Proverbs 15, 33. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. When Jesus was tempted the third time, It says that Satan took him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor and said he could have them. He would give them everything. Jesus would have all the power, all the fame, all the notoriety. Friends, can I just remind you that we still can go to Rome today and see the structures that Jesus saw from that mountaintop, the Colosseum, the Forum in Rome the marble-laid streets, the colonnades, the glory of, you know, Rome. He would have seen that. He would have seen the glory of Caesar Augustus. He would have seen all those things, and he would have been tempted towards that fame. And I would say probably um, the earthly authority without having to suffer the experience of the cross. He could have an imitation of the glory he was promised in his obedience to the cross right away. He could get it immediately. Jesus, and this is so important, we need to remember that there is this theological reality. It is something beyond our comprehension, which I love, but it's called the hypostatic union, that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He was both. So he knew, knew that he felt the allure of power, of fame, of, of just comfort, He knew it. He saw everything, and he had a quick road to success. He was also God, and he knew that as a holy and sinless man, he would have to be rejected, scourged, and crucified, and die our death alone on a cross. Boy, the easy road must have been appealing that day. It must have looked so appealing to see this road to success that didn't require the cross, to get all the glory and adulation without that, except for one thing. That's true except for one thing. Jesus feared God, and he walked with him. And so Jesus submitted his personal desires for the easier road, for the desires of his heavenly Father. And he followed and obeyed. He followed and obeyed. Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only was his response. Once again, Jesus is quoting directly out of the book of Deuteronomy, that family history book that tells the story of God's faithfulness and the brokenness of Israel. Because what we see is in his quotation. Well, let's just look at it. In Deuteronomy chapter six, God gives a warning to the people of Israel as they are leaving 40 years in the desert and coming into the promised land, living in the promised land. It says this. When the Lord your God brings you there and you are filled with all kinds of good things, you are eating from vineyards you didn't plant, drinking from cisterns you didn't dig, when you are eating and tending to the olive groves and pressing the wine that you didn't tend and farm, when you are doing these things and you've been given all these good things, be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. Don't forget God when you get to a good place and church I think that has to ring in our ears because I think this more than anything is the crisis of our day and age in the church. We live a comfortable life in many ways. Much of who we are isn't interrupted by um, hardship like it was in this day. 
We live a comfortable life. And I think this warning should echo in our ears because when Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only, what it's saying is by actively worshiping, we remember who he is. And God's call to Israel was, don't forget me when things get good. You're gonna want to forget that I am the God who led you out of Egypt and brought you to this land, but don't forget me because he knows the minute we forget him, we fall into every manner of evil and sin. What God is saying in Christ Jesus and in the book of Deuteronomy is this. Don't forget me. Worship me. Stay close to me. Walk in fear of me. Why does he say that? Because he knows our nature is to drift and to stray. And when we drift and when we stray, we recognize that we don't fear the Lord anymore. Jesus feared the Lord. He would not bring honor to himself. Jesus knew that that temptation can come in forms like hunger, in forms of religious prestige, and in the form of profound success. He knows that temptation, and our hearts, like his, must be determined to worship the Lord only, to stay in the rhythm of worshiping the Lord because there are so many other offers of easy success or whatever feels like success. There's so many ways, you know, to get rich or die trying, to get yours, to go out and make a name for yourself. There's so many ways, but here's the problem, church. When we go out and do that and we forget to worship the Lord our God and serve him only, when we forget that he is the God who has brought us into a wonderful and good land and he has blessed our lives and he has done so much for us and we forget him, we fall into sin and we justify it. And Jesus made no such justification. So when success does come. It comes from God. And we must be careful to fear him and to hold even our success in a very open posture because our success is from him. And we can get really secure in the blessings he gives us and forget that our true security lies only in the one who blessed us, not in the blessings. This earth will burn and everything in it, but you and I are eternal. And the blessing that we have is in Christ Jesus that we are forgiven of our sin, that we are made new. How do we walk in the fear of the Lord? We remember that he is the only thing we worship. He is number one in our hearts. He is God high and lifted up. We cannot forget to worship the Lord our God only. Why? Because we, like the people of Israel, are so quick to turn away when things get easy. So let me ask, how does this apply to you? How does the fear of the Lord help you respond to the temptation for more power, more fame, or more mo money? <laughs> this is a terrible way to say it. How does that work in your life? How is this going to apply to you? Because I guarantee you, like me, feel a sense of conviction that the comfort has gotten a little easy and maybe we've drifted from the one thing that matters most, the one thing that walking in the fear of the Lord compels us to do. When you see God as he is, you walk in an attitude of worship, in adoration of who he is, not of what he's provided. Church, look at this message that we see today and realize that Jesus is the model of walking in the fear of God. It's not, oh, what do I do? It's a confident understanding that God has given us his word to deflect the temptations and the temptations are bent on one thing, leading us away from an intimate walk with God that will transform not only us, but the world around us. How now do we respond in the lives we live? I invite you to model your life after Jesus and walk in the fear of the Lord by washing your life and sifting it through the word of God. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are, for the word you speak and have spoken, for the word we hold up as, as the scriptures and know that it preaches and teaches and is living, active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, I pray that you would use your word to convict us and transform us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are the one who knows every temptation we've faced. You face them and you pass that test by knowing the word and deflecting it, 
deflecting every temptation in the fear of the Lord. May that be true of us. Help us to fear you even as we follow you. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We confess you as Lord, Savior, and hope over all things. Come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit and grow your church. Transform her into the image of you whom we love and serve. Amen.
We've said it so many times in this church, but it's because we know it to be true. Sin is not what you do, it's who you are apart from Christ. Your nature is sinful, and my nature is sinful. And that's not hopeful at all, except for the fact that Jesus Christ has given us his righteousness. And I invite you today, I invite you to remember that the, the one who gave us his righteousness that we are righteous in the eyes of God. We are made right and we are in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. The one who did that, Jesus Christ, he modeled for us a life that lives in fearful but yet very strong anticipation of the kingdom of God coming near. When Satan tempted him, Jesus believed in the purposes of God and he believed they were bigger than his appetite, bigger than his need for Adoration. Remember, he was a man. That would have been a temptation. Bigger than his need for fame, power, and success. Jesus knows your temptations. So in the power of Christ, we are invited to remember the one who did it first and to live like him. So I invite you, sift your life through this word. Be in your devotions every day. Get in the word of God so that when temptation does come, you're able to respond actively and quickly with your family story. Your family story. If you wonder how best to respond to temptation, I would invite you to memorize those three things that Jesus said. It is written, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Memorize that. Because your appetites are going to call to you. And maybe it's not food you're craving, but something's gonna call on you and you're gonna say, wait a minute, it is written that I don't live by bread alone, whatever that thing is I want, but I live by the word of God. And claim it over your life. Remind yourself that when you're invited to focus and give all your time and all your energy into something that, that requires literally you to worship it, it's the one thing you think about 24-7. Remind yourself, remind yourself of what Jesus said. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. When your desire to be held in a certain esteem in community and whatever is out there and you feel like you're gonna assert yourself, remind yourself of what Jesus said. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't let your ego define who he is. I invite you to respond the way Jesus did. Model a life after him and you will find people noticing a gentle spirit in you that is not in any way weak it's the powerful, very living word of God coming out of your life. I invite you to hold up that shield of faith and let the scripture, the word of God, defend you from the temptation of the enemy. You're gonna be tempted. The question is, how will you respond? My prayer and blessing over you is this, that God would enable you to remember those words and proclaim back at your tempter, away from me, away from me. Do not put the Lord your God to the test grace and peace to you as you go about that. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to, I think you're in a building, but you don't have to leave it. You just are dismissed. Grace and peace, friends. Hey, thank you for joining us for our worship service today. Uh, we hope that the words that were spoken will encourage you to grow in your walk with the Lord. Um, and just know, too, if you have a prayer request or you'd like to pray with somebody, we would love to do that with you. Um, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and then press the number three key and somebody on our prayer team will get back with you shortly. Again, I just want to remind you at 11.15, so in a few short minutes, we're going to be having our online shakeout lesson for the kids. So kids, make sure that you come back to tune in for that at 11.15 this morning. All right, that's all I have for you this morning. Um, I hope that you guys all have a, have a great week, and we look forward to having you join us again.